The subject of our panel today is constitutional democracy in 2021. And we have some really terrific engaging papers and I think they're gonna tee up some really interesting conversation. Um, so uh, I'll just mention that Anya Bernstein uh, is here from uh, SUNY Buffalo Law School, Glenn Staduski from uh, Michigan State Law School, uh, Greg Ellenson um, is a Clemenko Fellow and lecturer on law at Harvard Law School, and I'd be remiss if I did not mention he is a graduate of Stanford Law School, and we proudly claim him. And uh, uh, Kyle Langbart is here from uh, University of Nebraska College of Law. So I'm not going to do any more elaborate uh, uh, introductions at the, uh, at the uh, uh, suggestion of the organizer so that we can uh, get right to substance. So we will start uh, with uh, Anya and Greg. Um, I will keep time. We're asking you to uh, stick to 12 minutes. So I will send a chat to one or both of you at the 10 minute mark. So just keep an eye on the chat window um, and um, take it away. So thanks everyone. It's been a fun day um, so far. Um, as we all know, the US along with many other democratic countries has recently confronted a wave of populism. Populism comes in lots of flavors and people use the term to mean lots of things. We focus on the particular form in recent US politics, contemporary authoritarian populism. This version of populism trades on the liberationist and egalitarian history of the term, but actually works in a somewhat different way. Rather than making politics more inclusive or spreading the wealth, contemporary authoritarian populism undermines and delegitimizes some fundamental tenets of Republican democracy. Drawing on political science studies, we identify three key traits. First, contemporary authoritarian populism is anti-pluralist. It presents the people as a unified mass with a single will, and it imagines a populist leader who uniquely, completely, and all by himself embodies that will. Second, this discourse is anti-institutional. It seeks to bypass the institutions of democracy that mediate disagreement and negotiate opposing interests. Instead, it imagines a direct line of communication between the leader and the unified people whose will he embodies. And third, populism presents the world as a Manichaean struggle between good and evil. Populist discourse tends to pit the morally pure people against a corrupt and unresponsive elite sometimes an economic elite, but often instead an intellectual one. These three traits, anti-pluralism, anti-institutionalism, and Manichaeanism combine to create a discourse that is both universalizing and exclusionary. Populists claim to speak for all the people, which means that those who disagree don't really count as people at all. In fact, populist rhetoric denies the very legitimacy of disagreement. Since this discourse presents the people as united with a common will that the leader embodies, those who voice other opinions or have other interests are easy to present as enemies of that people rather than legitimate participants in the political process. This way of imagining the populist leader as the only one who really understands the people, of course, also means that it's the leader who gets to say what the people want. This rhetoric leaves leaders unconstrained by treating disagreement as illegitimate. Note how starkly this vision contrasts with the commitments of Republican democracy, which assumes that a society will naturally include many different interests um, and which uh, values political institutions that mediate these interests through ongoing negotiations and provisional settlements, not in an absolute or all or nothing sort of way. So those are some key traits of contemporary authoritarian populism in politics pretty controversial and clearly in tension with democratic commitments. What we argue in our paper though, is that these same rhetorical traits have become quite prevalent in legal theory in a way that has not really been acknowledged or even noticed. Although it's tailored for the legal setting, this judicial populism also denies pluralism, denigrates institutions and presents law and politics as a Manichaean struggle. And we argue it also stands in tension with key democratic commitments. Just to be clear, we're not making a causal argument here. We don't think political populism caused judicial populism or vice versa. And we make no historical claims about their coevolution. Instead, we're pointing out a resonance, a, a set of elective affinities. And we think it's important to recognize not just because it's interesting, 
but because it's pernicious. Both political and judicial populism denigrate the legitimacy of basic democratic tenets and structures like institutional mediation, multilateral negotiation, and ongoing deliberation. And the prevalence of this rhetoric in one sphere seems to normalize its use in the other. Political and judicial populism, in other words, are mutually enabling, and they both undermine democracy. So how do these populist traits manifest in legal writing? We see the Manichaean impulse when legal writers pit an innocent and pure people against some kind of elite that oppresses them, whether that's pointy-headed experts, unelected bureaucrats, or counter-majoritarian judges themselves. Writers who employ this rhetoric often write themselves and their colleagues into the story too. They paint themselves as the true emissaries of the people, while legal writers who disagree are treated as absurd, underhanded activists or otherwise illegitimate. The anti-institutionalist leaning uh, comes out in legal writing that resists taking into account the work of democratic institutions like legislatures and uh, agencies that mediate computing it, competing interests. And anti-pluralism emerges when legal writers claim special access to the one true meaning of the law, embodying legal meaning like the populist leader embodies popular will. In the legal sphere, these traits take on a particular orientation. The legal writer's ability to suss out the universal and incontestable meaning of law is often phrased in terms of adherence to the proper method. In this image, using the right method gets a legal writer to the right result in a way that's not subject to legitimate disagreement. Like political populists then, legal writers who use this rhetorical framework position themselves as the only ones who can legitimately speak for the law and thus for the people's will. And of course, when you're the only one who can speak, you can pretty much say what you want. Judicial populism thus offers a store of rhetorical trope stories and approaches. Anyone can dip into that store and many writers deploy some of these strategies now and again. The rhetoric is neutral as to policy ends. It's equally available to all. In fact, that's what makes it so useful. This rhetoric provides a way to justify the use of legal power to whatever ends, rather than as a means for achieving some particular policy goal. Judicial populist rhetoric tends to present law as autonomous from politics and even society. This vision of law is somehow divorced from the social structures and relationships that produce and implement it implies that legal writers need not and should not justify or even consider the effects of their decisions on that society. That implication in turn leaves judges free to use judicial populist rhetoric to justify their use of power without the pressure to justify that power's effects. So as we said, the tropes of judicial populism are available to everyone, and we find that many legal writers dip in and use them occasionally. But there are also a few well-known strands of legal theory that have really put anti-institutionalism, anti-pluralism, and Manichaeanism at the center of the way they articulate themselves. So for example, these judicial populist traits are deeply ingrained in textualism. Textualism presents legal text as the clear unequivocal embodiment of the people's well, will. The text can have only one meaning and it must be that meaning for all time. Textualists claim to re have respect for legislative compromises embedded in statutory text, but they also emphatically don't care how Congress works or how legislators predicted the law would function. Their method, in a sense, goes around the mediating institutions of democracy, and textualists even chastise judges who do look to legislative process. They argue that taking into account the work of democratic institutions itself undermines the rule of law, and they insist that it's illegitimate to care about the effects that their legal decisions will have. So in effect, they claim that they, and only they, represent the people, and that textualism, and only textualism, is the legitimate method for doing so. So that is anti-pluralist, anti-institutional, and Manichaean in the exact same way that we see in political populism. Originalism makes similar claims. It claims to be the only legitimate method for interpreting constitutional text, and it claims that alternatives are illegitimate per se. It assumes that the founding generation embodied its will in the constitution and that this will must control forever in the way that they embodied it. By insisting that 
audience understanding, so original public meaning, guide their interpretation while also ignoring most of the people who actually formed the Constitution's original audience. Originalists engage in the same sort of moralized anti-pluralism as do political populists. And as some originalists themselves have pointed out, this approach has some distinct payoffs. If originalism reveals the true meaning of the law, and if originalism itself already is the law, then there is no need to justify the choices that judges make. Instead of messy deliberation and debate and argument about what our laws should be or what legal methods we ought to use, what we might call democratic deliberation, such theories provide a single truth maker to settle things once and for all. The truth maker in this story is the imagined people unified across society and through history, its will uniquely accessible to those using the correct methods. So originalism and textualism thus echo populism's anti-institutional bent, solving the, the problem in scare quotes of pluralism and absolving legal writers of the need to justify their decisions on the merits. Another place we see a similar attitude is in unitary executive theory, which offers a substantive understanding of the constitution that's informed by the same ideological commitments and rhetorical tropes. The idea that there's one unified people with one unified will that can be embodied in one political leader with a full 100% national mandate, et cetera. This theory contains the same anti-pluralist, anti-institutionalist, Manichaean traits as political populism. And like political populism, it denigrates the complexities and trade-offs, nuances and negotiations of representative government and modern administration imagining a single leader with a national electoral mandate who will be righteous and fair without the need for negotiation or debate. Judicial populism constructs a rhetorical frame centered on the claim that law embodies a unified people's will, which judges can discern by using the right interpretive methods. This suggests that normative argument is unnecessary or even illegitimate. And that judges just need to use the right method to reach the single correct result that's already embodied in the law. Judges who openly consider normative values or practical consequences can in, in this frame easily be dismissed as illegitimate activist or something like that. So judicial populist rhetoric while building this frame really prizes minimalism. Writers in this vein tend to argue that judges should affect both law and policy as little as possible. Within the parameters of this rhetoric, that makes total sense. If the law is the crystallization of the people's will, then judges should just discern it by sticking as closely as possible to whatever's already there. That image seems to make the judge a weakling, somebody who merely enunciates decisions made by others, but, because it is only the judge who can discern the people's will embodied in the law, this image surreptitiously actually gives the judge a great deal of power. This image also presumes that there is some underlying untouched true law or policy to be found as though law and policy existed in a state of nature that the judge could discover with the right methods. In fact, of course, laws and policies are human products that are constantly evolving as the world around them changes. And there is no before the fall state of the law. And judges, of course, play a part in that evolution just like other government employees. So judicial populist rhetoric paints a very peculiar picture building on assumptions that directly contradict our actual experience of the law and of policy. This rhetoric does not really help judges ascertain the one true pre-existing meaning of the law, of course, because there is no such thing. It lets judges present themselves as mouthpieces for the people's will, rather than as the governmental actors that they are, whose decisions express normative commitments and have significant effects on society. Populist rhetoric resonates with real and legitimate anxieties about liberal constitutional democracy and in, in, for our purposes, especially about the counter-majoritarian role of courts. But just as there is no single popular will that can be embodied in one, in one political leader, so courts cannot actually eliminate judicial discretion. So given that, 
we think that courts should use the discretion that they inevitably wield to promote the values of Republican democracy. So to flesh out what we mean by that, we end the paper by uh, articulating some traits that we see as central to democratic judging as opposed to populist judging. For instance, valuing pluralism in information, in viewpoint, and in methodology. Respecting democratic institutions that mediate competing views, competing views both about what is the good and about how to achieve it. Recognizing that judges inevitably participate in that process and cannot rid themselves of the power that we have given them. And acknowledging the provisional and even deliberative nature of legal decisions. And therefore, uh, as a corollary, demanding that judges justify their decisions on the merits. So we argue in some that we should reject judicial, judicial populism in favor of Republican democracy in legal interpretation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Greg. Um, <clears throat> great, uh, let me just share my uh, slides. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for taking the time to hear me present this research. Uh, just by way of background, it, this paper is part of a research agenda that explores how political parties shape constitutional and administrative law and the legislative process. Uh, so as many folks will know, over the past decade, scholars have begun to think about how parties interact with our formal institutions of government. And the basic institution that's emerged from this work is that when the president and Congress are on different teams, the checks and balances between the two branches will be sustained. But when members of the same party control both branches, well, then not so much. And I think there's surely a lot of value to that framework. But I argue in the paper, and I wanna argue in, in my time today that we need a more sophisticated treatment of political parties. One that acknowledges that both parties are often, if not always, internally divided. And as we'll see, thinking about parties in this way points us to the rules, procedures, and forums that make it possible for co-partisans to work together. So the big idea here is this. When we stop imagining that parties automatically function, function as cohesive teams and think of them instead as loose affiliations or big tents, I think that changes how we understand the separation of powers, federalism, and the role of courts in our constitutional system. So to try and make that case, I want to do three things. I'll focus on the national government, though I'm happy to talk about federalism in the Q&A if folks are interested. Uh, first, I'll underscore a simple descriptive point. Uh, sure, parties have moved farther apart from one another. They polarize. But that doesn't mean they're any less internally divided. Second, I want to briefly walk through how party divisions shape the separation of powers. And I'll argue that paying attention to party divisions should prompt us to rethink the dynamics underlying unified and divided government. And third, I'll argue that party divisions have some important representation reinforcing features that bear on how our national institutions currently work and how we might go about making some useful reforms. So we can start with the empirical point. As this sampling of recent headlines suggest, the fact is that Democrats often don't see eye to eye with other Democrats, nor Republicans with Republicans. Most recently, of course, Republicans have struggled with one another over former President Trump's decision to contest last fall's election and over how best to respond to the resulting January 6th Capitol riot. And that fight is obviously still ongoing. The Democrats are no less divided uh, with Biden's victory and the party's wins in the two Senate, uh, Georgia Senate runoff elections, fights over appointments and policy have taken center stage as Democrats have started to govern. So I think those divisions aren't just political facts. They shape what we care about as lawyers when we think about the separation of powers. That includes the actual substance of legislation. So most recently in the last day or so, democratic divisions have shaped the now passed stimulus package. Last decade, they determined the scope of the Affordable Care Act. And sometimes these kinds of divisions even affect oversight. Uh, Democrats battled over the scope of the first set of impeachment articles that were filed against Trump last year. 
And uh, that's not to mention nominations where we've seen disagreement among Democrats torpedo at least uh, the nomination of Neera Tandon to head OMB. So let's flesh out what internally divided parties actually mean for the relationship between the president and Congress. Paying attention to party divisions changes how we think about the familiar categories of unified and divided government. So the conventional view is that when the same party controls both branches, we won't have the separate interests and incentives that guarantee our system of checks and balances. The fear here is that the president will be able to run roughshod over Congress. When we emphasize internal party splits though, our diagnosis of unified government changes. When the majority party in Congress can't hold together, it's less likely that Congress will efficiently implement the president's legislative program. Even if there are some in the president's party who support his agenda without reservation, chances are they'll get bogged down in fights with colleagues who disagree. Framed this way, parties that are internally divided are actually constitutionally salutary. They make it harder for the executive to enact his legislative agenda without meaningful scrutiny from Congress. On the flip side, when one party controls Congress and the other party controls the White House, we tend to think that party rivalry will keep the separation of powers alive and well. So even if the mechanism isn't loyalty to a particular branch, but instead dislike of the other partisan team, we think that Congress should check the president and vice versa, much like what the framers envisioned. Here though, emphasizing internal party splits suggests this isn't quite right. If the majority party can't resolve its own internal differences, Congress is actually unlikely to check the executive. Sure, some members might be ready to battle the president, but others in the party may be more reluctant. And even if everyone agrees that pushing back against the executive is important, they might not agree on how to do it. So what all of that means is that under divided government, which is when we expect the separation of powers is gonna be most fiercely defended, we might actually see presidential power grow. In emphasizing the prevalence of party infighting, I don't wanna leave the impression that party cohesion is absent from Congress. Instead, I wanna argue that as lawyers, we ought to pay attention to the rules and procedures that parties use to try and hang together. When we do that, as I'll argue shortly, we can try and diagnose some of the pathologies of our constitutional system. But just to give you a few examples of what I'm talking about, consider some of the rules and procedures that empower the House Speaker to control the flow of legislative business. The Speaker dictates the terms of debate, deciding who gets to speak on the floor and when. She also has the final say over appointments to the Rules Committee where she can craft special rules that specify how a bill will be considered and if amendments will be allowed. Both parties also have internal methods of inducing cohesion. Republicans have formalized a practice known as the Hastert rule, where leaders prioritize only those proposals that are favored by a majority within the party. Democrats for their part rely on a steering committee to adjudicate among competing factions. So of course, these institutions aren't always sufficient to heal or even paper over party divisions. And it's certainly the case that some leaders might be better able to use them than others. But what matters for us is that they're critical to determining whether parties will do the constitutional work that we've come to expect of them. In the remainder of the time, I wanna highlight what I see as the benefits of party divisions. The core of the argument here is that I think party divisions can help to promote representation. And as a result, it's important to find ways to productively harness them. Here, I'll start with Congress and end with courts. Uh, I'm happy to say more about the presidency and the Q&A. So when it comes to Congress, I think it, it's helpful to think first about party centrists and second about party hardliners. For centrists, even, if, even as polarization is increased, Centrists in both parties continue to profess a commitment to finding legislative solutions that are supported by bipartisan majorities. Uh, but their tentative efforts to work across the aisle are often quashed by party leaders. The fear here is that a bipartisan victory will give the other side a win or that it might expose divisions between co-partisans. So given that party leaders have a far stronger procedural arsenal than legislative centrists, we might consider institutional reforms that could even the playing field at least a little bit. For instance, one could relax some of the burdens that members face when they try and use a discharge petition 
a procedural tool that lets rank and file members go over the heads of party leaders and release legislation with majority support directly to the floor. Turning to hardliners, it's common to lament their influence in contemporary politics. And I'm certainly not here to recommend that we further empower them, but I do wanna point out some of the downsides of undermining their influence. Under both unified and divided government, hardliners can actually help maintain a Madisonian balance between stasis and energy. Hardliners are sometimes the only real obstacle to the executive of their party getting his way. Here, it might help to remember that it was the House Freedom Caucus that slowed the Trump administration's efforts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And hardliners are also sometimes essential to prodding meeker colleagues to check the executive. Last year, for example, the Democrats most determined to use the House's constitutional power to hold the president accountable were liberal members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. The idea that party divisions can help to promote representation is central to one way in which I think party divisions can help us think differently about courts. Consider the question of whether it's appropriate for courts to update statutes when Congress hasn't. In Justice Kavanaugh's dissent in Bostock against Clayton County from last term, he argues that the court needn't have inter intervened because congressional majorities were already poised to amend Title VII to add protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So the trouble here is that majority party leaders sometimes use agenda control tools to keep issues that divide their party off the table, regardless of whether those have broader majority support. So I think we ought to be skeptical that an amendment with the real potential to expand Title VII's protections would necessarily come to a vote in either chamber, just because a floor majority might favor it. So I think that reality means the court has to weigh two competing principles. On the one hand, Congress gets to make its own rules. And as a co-equal branch, courts are supposed to respect that right. But on the other, courts often see themselves as preserving the majoritarian character of our political system. That's certainly the thrust of footnote four of Caroline Products and a lot of subsequent thinking about the role of courts in our constitutional system. So against that backdrop, we might see judicial updates to statutes as a way for courts to compensate for the mismatch between features of the legislative process and our internally divided parties. The bottom line is that I think better constitutional government is possible if policymakers can effectively harness party divisions. They have the potential to restructure the political agenda and to make it more responsive to the popular will. They can also ensure that government doesn't move too fast or break things. With that, I'm happy to close. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to share this work and I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. Great, thank you so much. Kyle. Yeah, hi everybody and, and, uh, and thanks. Uh, thanks to, to Jane in particular for, uh, for reading through this paper. Um, you know, just a, a little bit about this. The paper itself is is really in pretty rough shape. I wrote most of this back in, in 2019. And so 2020 was just like a huge year for the platform economy in all kinds of obvious ways. And uh, 2021 is shaping up to be uh, equally epic. So there's kind of a, a Rip Van Winkle factor going on in this in this paper. Um, you know, the, the other concern that I have with this, and I'll be interested to see what people have to say about this, is that um, the paper itself is, is just really broad at this point. I kind of set out initially to write a piece that had more of a First Amendment uh, focus. I soured on the claim that I was trying to make, but I you know, had all this content I'd written, and I kind of tried to reshape it in a different direction. But I, I fear that you wind up with something that, that's rather diffuse. So I'll, I'll be interested to get people's comments on, you know, uh, what I should do with this. Anyway, so here's the, the big picture with this one. Um, you know, people typically associate the concept of economic planning with, uh, with, with states. And the association that people make between the private sector and markets is, I think, even closer, up to the point where people will use terms like market ordering and private ordering as basically interchangeable terms. But you know, the fact is that there's always been a lot of central planning on the private side as well. 
And what I'm talking about here is just, you know, plain old business firms. So the idea is that if, a, if an employee in a firm changes departments, they do it because they're ordered to do it. It's not because one department outbids the other. You know, somebody orders a, a sandwich at, at Subway, they don't open a bidding process, you know, among, among sandwich providers. Uh, they, they just order individual employees to do it. And so we could think of the, the firm um, as just a little boundary within which unstructured bargaining would be uh, nightmarishly inefficient, and it's much more efficient to just resort to command and control. So uh, within any given market, we might think of bargaining as kind of like the, the water, and each ind individual firm is this little bubble of planning that occurs within the market. So you get this uh, you know, kind of fizzy uh, LaCroix-like like beverage. Um, you know, and I'm not gonna extend that metaphor in, into more detail, so I'm gonna leave it there. But, um, you know, it, if that's the, the case, you know, if we're going to think of firms as these little bubbles of planning, then what you get within the firm is a pretty authoritarian uh, in, environment. You know, we, you don't have the same kinds of uh, expectations by, by uh, default of um, liberties and rights that you would have against the state. And of course, state action doctrine uh, re reinforces this. So instead of the Constitution, we depend on, um, you know, regulatory or legislative interventions within the firm to protect liberal or democratic values there, you know, public accommodations law, labor law. Um, there's an obvious kind of normative mapping that we can draw between equal protection and civil rights law. Um, you know, that, that's how we import these kind of quasi-constitutional values into these environments. Now, the, the point that my paper makes here is that these really dominant platforms, and I call them uh, apex platforms, but it's not a, a very well-defined concept. It's uh, it just kind of a loose thing. You know, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Google, um, you know, these are, are firms. And, and as such, they're little bubbles of planning. The thing is that um, there are some differences here. And the first one is that they're able to operate at a much wider range than uh, traditional business firms could. And the reason that they're able to expand the boundary of the firm so far is because they have this access to data and computational power that's really unprecedented. Um, you, you know, classically, the, the argument against state central planning, this is a, uh, an argument from Hayek, is that there's no way that any kind of uh, central planning board could ever gather all of this information. They need to set prices, plan resource allocation, and so on. You know, even if they could, there's no human bureaucracy that could crunch the numbers. None of that kind of thing is a problem for Amazon. Amazon has, has the data. It, it has uh, in, incredible computational capacities. And so what you get is um, a, a kind of central planner that, that's not just a this little bubble of planning within online retail, but that actually swallows up a big part of the, the online retail market, about half of it, and plans, structures, you know, shapes all of the transactions that would otherwise go on there uh, under uh, uncoordinated plan, uh, processes. Now, so that's one difference, is just the scope of these platforms. The other big difference um, between these giant platforms and, and more traditional business firms is that they process human attention as a key resource. And so these are advertising companies for the most part, and uh, they depend on matching people with content, matching people with people, and they do so in a really, in a really fine grained way. And in doing that, uh, what they do is they take the same kind of uh, privatized central planning approach that you would see at a company like, like Amazon in the retail sector, and they apply it to aspects of culture or even what we might have uh, thought kind of figuratively as the marketplace of ideas. Now, th there are all kinds of things that are vaguely creepy about replacing um, the you know, again, figurative marketplace of ideas with a more planned and structured process. But um, I, I wanted to kind of focus on just one, one dimension of it. And I'll be interested to see if people think the, the constitutional dimension here is uh, 
ultimately superfluous. I think I may be going in that in that direction. Um, but I'd say, you know, if we if we think of the kinds of values that uh, the Constitution captures, we could put them in, in two broad buckets. One would deal with like rights and equality, and the other would would deal with uh, structural values, uh, mostly concerned with preventing one uh, governmental body from usurping another. Um, let's start with with rights and how these can be implicated by these firms. You know, traditionally, take equality. Um, you know, we think of equality as a value that can be threatened on the private side uh, just as much as on, on the public side. We're used to the idea that we would use civil rights regulation as a kind of complement to equal protection. Um, but now take the freedom of expression. We think of freedom of expression as operating in a really radically different, different way. Um, we, we don't say that uh, op-ed contributors have free speech rights that they can enforce against the New York Times. In fact, we say the New York Times has free speech rights as an editor. And so what accounts for the difference? Well, I, I think what accounts for the difference is that we're used to thinking of wrongs like uh, you know, workplace harassment and so on as offending the equality of norm, even if they occur on a really local and like firm specific scale. Freedom of expression, on the other hand, uh, we, we think of as a harm that uh, needs to take place on a, a broader and more uh, market spanning scale. So even if we have a major player, like say a, a broadcast network or a major regional newspaper, and, and even if we say that it's taking a, a censorious approach uh, with respect to the kind of concept or content that it'll carry, we say, well, there, there are alternative channels. You can go to another newspaper, you can go to another, another television network. We only really get concerned about the concept of, of censorship if we have like a governmental actor that's capable of um, in, enforcing its law across the entire jurisdiction. But once you have a, a firm that has managed to kind of enclose a whole area of uh, previously unstructured activity, and replace unstructured uh, activity with a more planned, uh, planned sort of process. And I'm thinking of entities like Facebook, entities like, like Twitter and the way that they match people with content. Um, we're now looking at entities that are capable of acting against speech in ways that are more dramatic, further reaching, more preclusive than, um, uh, you know, say a censor at, at NBC or something like that. And so we can think of a few uh, really striking examples from the past few years. I mean, 2017, um, Cloudflare, which is a primary security services provider, uh, knocked Stormfront, which is a neo-Nazi website, just off the internet for a few days. Um, we we recent saw, recently saw Amazon Web Services uh, perform kind of a similar trick against the, the parlor. Uh, platform, which was kind of a, a haven to uh, hard right people. Um, Facebook and Twitter last year is really dramatic, um, it kind of squashed distribution of this New York Post story on, on Hunter Biden. You know, it, it looked kind of fishy, but, uh, you know, really kind of brought the sledgehammer down on it. And then, of course, we have the, the Trump suspensions. Now, I think... Um, you know, right right now, we can still kind of comfort ourselves and say, well, we're talking about uh, private actors here. We're not talking about about state actors. And and on top of that, they're really performing some pretty vital services, I think, for the health of our democracy. But over the long run, I think it's pretty clear that a platform that had these capacities could do really, really immense damage, um, maybe by inviting election interference instead of, um, instead of blocking it, uh, maybe by engaging in flagrant viewpoint discrimination. Um, one possibility that's especially disturbing is of electoral manipulation. Um, Facebook undertook a, a behavioral experiment in, in 2010 that showed that it was capable of driving turnout selectively by showing people I voted stickers uh, based on past activities on the platform. They had a second experiment in 2014 uh, where they, they proved that they could engineer like emotional contagion by uh, showing groups of people happier content or, or sadder content. I don't think the platforms would publish this kind of research <laughs> anymore, but um, you can you can imagine uh, 
possibilities for for really serious interference. How you know how do we how do we respond to these kinds of threats, uh, not just to let's say free expression values, but but maybe to the integrity of the democratic process? Well, it would be nice to think that there might be some um, uh, kind of market driven approaches. So first of all, we might think of uh, better internal governance or maybe even kind of flashy initiatives like Facebook's oversight board or whatever. Uh, that's great. I, I think the Facebook oversight board is a marginal improvement on where they've been so far. Obviously though, the, the concern is what if we're not looking at Facebook in 20 years, but we're looking at um, a, you know, a, a, a more sinister kind of platform, what would be the public response then? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about antitrust remedies, breaking companies up. I think a lot of this is basically, uh, basically orthogonal to the problem and, and aims at um, maybe ma making a platform like Facebook or Twitter vulnerable to usurpation by some future platform. I don't think that actually uh, uh, mitigates the, the possibility for uh, authoritarian behavior. All it does is it just introduces a kind of uh, warlordist dynamic to the picture, which might actually be counterproductive. Um, there's this concept of information fiduciaries that maybe these platforms should uh, take on fiduciary rights with respect to users. Um, you know, I think the big problem here, aside from some internal uh, conceptual inconsistencies, is that it punts on all of the specifics of what the platforms would actually have to do. And I'm generally skeptical of, of uh, any kind of regime that would try to check the platforms uh, in a way that, that relied all that heavily on, on courts. Courts don't usually um, govern uh, complex industry or, or uh, or even um, complex governmental processes all that effectively. Think of something like um, the, the auto industry. Uh, you know, we, we tried regulating auto safety through the common law. We eventually migrated to a regulatory approach. Say, take the same thing with, with civil rights. Uh, the um, Supreme Court and the federal judiciary was not uh, a, an, an effective instrument on its own for promoting school desegregation. But once we got more administrative involvement, things began to move along. So what I, I fear is that we're going to be forced to move toward a similar kind of close regulatory uh, paradigm with respect to these, uh, these platforms with regard to speech decisions and, and so on. Um, and, sorry to interrupt, uh, Kyle. Could you could you try to wrap up, please? I'm sorry, I'm I'm chatting oh, you, but it's you're probably not looking at the chat. So. Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I I think there there are potential First Amendment concerns that that come up there, but more profoundly, uh, there's a concern of a kind of arms race between uh, private governance institutions and public governance institutions that would really ratchet up the. Uh, overall level of risk in undesirable ways. So thanks everybody and, and sorry to go over there. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanna make sure we have enough time for um, questions um, from the audience. Um, so uh, these are three really um, rich and engaging papers. And I, I thank the, auth uh, the authors for teeing up so many interesting questions. For many of us, the state of our constitutional democracy and constitutional polity is sort of top of mind right now. And so these are uh, very creative, I think, interventions. Um, uh, Anya and Greg focusing on judicial, uh, sorry, Anya and Glenn uh, focusing on judicial intervention and the relationship of judicial methodology to our political institutions. Um, Greg focusing on the dynamics of political polarization and and um, suggesting we need a more fine-grained uh, picture that attends to uh, internal party fractiousness. Um, Kyle focusing on the outsized uh, power of uh, platforms, his, his apex uh, platforms in reshaping so much of our world and in, in meaningful ways forming sort of new institutions that are, that are displacing um, existing institutions. So all of that really, um, uh, draws our attention to important problems in democracy. Um, so thank you for that. Um, a few comments on each one. Um, having read an earlier draft of uh, Anya and Greg's, uh, sorry, Glenn, Anya and Glenn, why did you both have to have a name starting with G? Um, 
having read an earlier draft, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to sort of watch uh, the evolution uh, and the iteration is such a provocative and, and rich paper. Um, from where I sit, your descriptions of textualism and originalism as practiced by many of their adherents are compelling to me. The idea that there is always a singular right answer to be confidently found in the face of ambiguity, if only the judge uses a single correct methodology, um, is, as you suggest, I think, re reductionist, deeply hubristic, and in the context of statutory interpretation, often very disrespectful uh, to Congress. So all of that seems exactly right to me. The question I'm left with is whether or not this is really populist in a meaningful sense. In the, in the early part of your paper, you invoke the idea, and, and Glenn talked about this, of authoritarians who are in, uh, quoting one of the scholars you, you quote, are always anti-pluralist and claim the exclusive right to uh, speak for the people. Now, to be sure, there's plenty of rhetoric uh, of anti-elitism uh, in judicial opinions, and I think your use of Justice Scalia's uh, dissent uh, in Lawrence is a great exhibit A for that, uh, uh, for that proposition, a pungent example of kind of anti-cosmopolitan, anti-elitism uh, appeal. But let's compare uh, Scalia's dissent in Lawrence to his dissent and the Chief Justice's dissent in Obergefell, right? One of the most salient uh, decisions of the, the last uh, several decades. And there are notes of anti-elitism and anti-cosmopolitanism in both of those dissents, but, but both make a very strong appeal precisely to the value of messy pluralist democracy. They lament the way the court is interrupting democratic processes, which has yielded victories you know, for both sides in the marriage equality debate. Now, maybe that's a strategic kind of argument, uh, but it is an embrace of pluralism. Um, and I think there are other examples uh, of that. And so one question is whether anti-elitism, uh, uh, particularly anti-judicial elitism, necessarily equates to populism in the, in the, in the way that you uh, invoke it. Now you say in the paper that populism does not have a, a single political valence, and I take that to mean we might think that populists, like many textualists and originalists, are only conservative. And you say no, and you cite, for example, Justice Kagan in the Janus case about union dues, uh, and and quote her language about black ro uh, black robed rulers overriding citizen choices as a kind of populist rhetoric. And I guess my question again, is this really populist? I mean, it's a sort of off the shelf argument against judicial activism and those in black robes claiming too much power, which are, you know, very familiar and longstanding part of our uh, uh, discourse. So does this really resonate with authoritarian populism? Um, I'm not so sure. Um, to some degree, the judicial affect and rhetoric that, um, that uh, Anya and Gleg, uh, uh, Glenn uh, point to reminded me of uh, my colleague Pam Carlin's uh, forward in the Harvard Law Review in 2012. And that's something you might want to consult. Uh, it was called Democracy and Disdain. And she talked about how disdainful of the political process the Supreme Court had become. And I think that, you know, that might help you address another question that I, I think it would be good for you to, to continue to think about which is, what exactly turns on calling this populist? How does and should that affect the normative debate you, I think, you know, fruitfully join over interpretive methodology and judicial rhetoric? Um, is it different to say judges are populist versus disrespectful of complicated, messy, pluralist processes? Um, you know, it, it, it seems to me that many of your critiques stand independent of the idea of populism. And so um, I would encourage you to sort of continue to think about, uh, about that, that framing and, and what turns on it. Um, so turning to Greg's paper, Greg does us a real service by, uh, by so ably spotlighting the internal divisions within the parties. And he draws very effectively on the work of political scientists like Francis Lee, who show that yeah, there might be rising rates of party cohesion 
uh, on roll call voting, but there's a lot more going on than just roll call voting. And a lot of it takes place off stage. Some of it is, you know, more public things, but they're not roll call voting, leadership disputes and other, other kinds of things before, after, independent of voting. So I thought, uh, Greg, you were most effective in showing that these internal divisions can widen the scope of debate, can enlarge the scope of representation, and can play an important role in terms of democratic theory. The implications for separation of powers, you know, horizontal separation of powers between and among the branches was much uh, less clear to me. Um, you note the original kind of Madisonian proposition about separation of powers, institutional ambition should be made to counteract uh, ambition. The executive, the thought was the executive would spar with Congress and vice versa because everybody wants to protect their own institutional turf. And I think authors like Levinson and Pildes and others who you engage with suggest, well, actually today, politicians are much more loyal to their party than to their institution. So the checks and balances that were supposed to arise from these institutional turf battles don't really arise. And the checks and balances um, are more likely to kick into gear when there's divided government because it's partisanship that activates people. Here, I think you're effective in showing that divided government does not always promote the kind of uh, intra-branch uh, cohesiveness that would activate branch against branch ambition run through the structure of partisanship. What's less obvious though, is that internal party fractiousness affirmatively promotes or addresses separation of powers concerns. In other words, the fact that there are these internal differences in parties doesn't necessarily cash out in politicians caring more about their institutions, right? And if we think of the Trump presidency as you know, a very long list of examples, but just a couple, you mentioned impeachment, but especially in the second impeachment, right? We have members of Congress who were personally threatened, um, but in huge numbers stayed loyal to their party and the president rather than standing up for their institution, which was literally the subject of attack by the executive branch, right? So partisanship there obliterated what you might've thought would be the instinct to, to protect uh, their own branch. Um, second example, the end run, the four year end run around the appointments clause and advice and consent by using acting after acting after acting official and Trump saying, actually, I prefer it that way because it gives me more flexibility. We not really get much of a challenge from his co-partisans in the Senate, um, even as we watch the Senate's role in advice and consent take quite a beating. Um, so I wonder you know, if you mean to connect uh, the, these internal party divisions to an affirmative protection of separation of powers or simply to respond to other critiques. On the latter, I think it's successful. On the former, I'm not sure that I saw that case made. Um, finally, um, uh, Kyle's paper, um, which might be the most dystopic of the three in that, you know, it really draws our attention to something that I think, you know, we're, none of us are missing in our lives these days, which is the outsized power of these platforms. And to think about what a coherent response might be is a, a Herculean task you have uh, set for yourself, uh, Kyle. You know, in terms of, is there a, a constitutional response? Should there be a constitutional response? I mean, one way to sort of bridge the state action issue, and I'll come back to that in a minute, might be to think, for example, in terms of what Bill Eskridge and John Farajan call super statutes. In their book, Republic of Statutes, right? They talk about, some statutes that so change you know, existing baselines and are so sticky and have such longevity that they become virtually part of the constitutional order, even without a constitutional amendment. The Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act, um, uh, the uh, Sherman Act and others. Um, so you might think of some statutory response to this enormous change wrought by the power of the platforms as sort of what they call small c constitutional statutory, but, but nevertheless um, uh, sounding in a particular kind of expanded constitutional register. 
But I do want to go back to state action. And you know, you you in your comments and in the paper sort of bracket it quickly and saying, well, these are not state actors, so we're not going to actually think about constitutional norms. Just two points to think about on that, because I thought it was a bit of the elephant in the room or the elephant in the paper was, well, what about what this means in terms of state action. You know, we could contrive some doctrinal arguments. They're not going to go anywhere, but you could think about, you know, the public functions doctrine, right? Company towns, white primaries in Texas. Maybe these platforms are now kind of, you know, exercising a public function in, in the way they virtually kind of govern us or at least organize our lives. Um, this Supreme Court, you know, not going to be interested, but it's something I think to think about. But the, the larger question I would push you on a little bit is your, your paper just so, so dramatically tees, tees up the question of uh, public and private. And, uh, and I'm taken back to, you know, a lot of, a lot of older writing on the public-private distinction. And it used to be, I mean, you can trace this all the way back to Marx, but it used to be the critical legal theorists, you know, in the 80s and early 90s who were critics of private power and the idea that we could draw this clean distinction between public and private power um, and said, you know, you're not, you're not really seeing how private power can be every bit as powerful as, as nominally public power. So that used to be sort of the province of the left. But think about today's politics, right? I mean, I'm thinking about Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and claims about how big tech is is, is uh, engaged in censorship. And you know, when you think about, for example, you mentioned Trump being kicked off Twitter, right? I mean, Twitter was really the White House press office for a lot of his presidency. And when he got kicked off Twitter, you know, everything kind of changed, right? And so there is a way in which I think your project really pushes us to think about the, the blending of, of, of public and private power in a way that I would encourage you not necessarily to bracket as you know not relevant to your to your topic. Okay, so um, let us open it up to audience questions. You can either uh, put a chat that just has a Q in it, which will tell me you want to ask a question, or I actually, when I moderate things, prefer the raise hand function. So if you are able to use that, uh, even better because I'm I'm less likely to miss it. But um, let's start with uh, uh, David Schwartz. Thanks. Um, those are um, three excellent presentations. And uh, I thought Jane's comments were wonderful uh, and really insightful. And <clears throat> my comment is for Glenn and Anya. And I'm ho I hope I can add a little bit of value to what Jane said. It may be I'm just going to repeat it in other words. Um, but um, I I'm really sympathetic to your argument. And I, you know, I'm increasingly bothered every time I reread a Scalia dissent in any of the um, LGBTQ rights cases, including Obergefell, about the, um, you know, the demagoguery that he engages in. And I think calling it populist has some, you know, some real resonance. Um, but I, I also detected a, a bit of slippage in the way you were using the term and the definition. I mean, there's a sense in which structurally, institutionally, <clears throat> You know, this, the courts can't be populist unless they're going to actually go out and try to, you know, drum up the, the support of the people to sort of take over the government. Um, you know, because populism is a movement that, you know, puts a, empowers some political leader um, and or, or a political program. And, um, you know, that's not how the courts work. And so what I kind of thought I saw you doing was talking about populism in, in um, two different ways, sort of trying to cash in on our current disapproval of right-wing populism. And, and one was um, judicial populism is, is rhetoric per se. And so it's a kind of judicial craft that you wanna disapprove of. And another thing that you seem to be saying at times was that judicial populism is, a, is rhetoric um, that, may support kind of epiphenomenally, um, you know, some aspect of the populist movement. And I'm not saying you can't do those things. It just, it would be helpful if you could be really explicit about what you're doing when, you know, and sometimes it just seemed like an analogy or a metaphor. Um, and so, you know, two, two examples that I uh, wanted to raise with you. 
So one was that the mapping of populism onto textualism, um, I, I would push you to think more about, you know, how consistently that works. And I'm thinking of the Bostock case, which was a, you know, a kind of a hypertextualist case that, that worked in a very pluralistic inclusive direction. And the other was with um, the unitary executive, um, the way you describe the unitary executive theory, you kind of described it as though it was a, a variant of, of Robert Mikkel's uh, Caesarism. Um, but I don't think that's what the, uh, you know, the, the, those who espouse the unitary executive think they're doing. And I don't think, you know, they, they would say that it's an increasing accountability, um, you know, in contrast to a, you know, a, um, an unresponsive, unrepresentative, um, uh, a bureaucracy. And in any event, their real goal is not even to empower the president. Their real goal is to shrink the, I think, to shrink the government, to shrink the bureaucracy, because a president can't directly manage a bureaucracy the size that we have now. So th they're really not a, their, their, their agenda is not populist. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I would encourage you to kind of, um, to, to see how those things track with your, um, with your definitions, I do think there is something that you have identified a phenomenon on the court. I think the, the kind of demagogic rhetoric is getting worse on the court. And so there is something going on there that should be disapproved of, but it may be that, that you wanna sort of attack it more directly instead of by analogies. You want to, Anya and I both unmuted at the same time. Know, why, yeah. why, don't, why don't you go first? <laughs> okay, so, and we'll try not to totally monopolize just because there's two of us. Um, maybe I'll just, so thank you, first of all, those are really helpful and perceptive comments. Um, I think um, the thing that I want to emphasize is that um, I see, and I think we describe populism here, as more a rhetorical framing of legitimacy um, and an imagination of what government law and politics is. And in that sense, it's available for lots of different uses as we've seen you know, in some sense through, through history. Um, so that's why we say it's not only used by one party or one wing, um, but I, I think thinking of it that way also addresses some of the problems you're talking about in terms of is it rhetoric per se or does it epiphenomenally support a populist government. Um, I think the, the kind of perniciousness that we see is that it helps normalize a vision of law and government that is deeply anti-democratic as though, um, you know, as though that were how democracy worked and, and that's how they resonate. I don't think we, either of us think that it is directly supporting some particular political project in terms of specific policy ends, but rather that it's participating in the normalization of a kind of perverse and anti-democratic idea of what the polity should look like. Yeah, and I, if I could just add, I mean, I, I think it is a, a great, question and it's something we've been struggling with a little bit is kind of the relationship between political populism and judicial populism exactly. And um, I think it's important to sort of emphasize that the way we see judicial populists trying to uh, claim to be uh, sort of representing the will of the people is not by trying to actually promote contemporary public opinion. That's certainly not what they're doing. Right, which is what political populists sort of uh, pretend to be doing. Right, we're doing what the people want. Judicial populists aren't interested in contemporary public opinion. What they're doing is claiming that legal text embodies the public will. Right, the constitutional text embodies the will of the framers, and the statutory text embodies the will of an elected Congress. And they, through the use of their methods, are the only ones who can legitimately speak um, for the people um, as it's embodied in legal text. So it, there's not a direct relationship between judicial populism and political populism. Um, judicial populists are not necessarily interested in supporting um, political populist movements, 
We're saying that they actually are populists because they are purporting to speak on behalf of the people when they interpret the law. There is though a complication, which is that by embracing unitary executive theory, which um, sort of aligns with or enables um, populism in the political sphere, um, you know, there, there's a, sort of the, a connection there. And um, I think, you know, we're, we're actually working on a companion paper talking about judicial populism and the regulatory state and how, um, you know, it sort of reflects this anti-administrative um, sort of ideology. And so, I mean, I think the bottom line is you cannot totally, you know, disentangle judicial populism from political populism, but I think it's helpful to think about judicial populism as, um, you know, these judges themselves being populists and they're representing the people um, through the one true way of understanding the law. Okay, we have uh, eight minutes and four hands up. So um, <laughs> take that into account. David Sloss. Thank you. Uh, so let me, I'll try and be brief. I was gonna link together sort of Kyle's paper and Greg's paper a little bit. I've been thinking a lot and writing about some of the kinds of issues that Kyle is dealing with, uh, particularly thinking about how we regulate uh, platforms. And I would associate myself with Jane's comment that uh, I think there really is a need for a new kind of super statute here, although there's a lot of disagreement about what that looks like, right? But, um, you know, uh, uh, the link to Greg's paper in my mind is there are all kinds of political obstacles to actually getting that kind of statute, right? And some of it is, uh, you, know, um, you know, party division and some of it is separation of powers, but there's a really interesting sort of angle on this that I just wanna throw out there, which is that what we're seeing, I think, is that a different kind of a separation of powers problem where private actors are taking on a real lawmaking role, right? We are seeing private actors engaging in what functionally looks a lot like lawmaking. And so you might expect Congress to push back and say, no, that's our role, right? You're doing, you're doing our job, you're intruding on our turf, so we're gonna step in and push back. But Congress at least so far has been paralyzed in trying to reclaim that lawmaking role from uh, the private actors, right? Uh, and you know, well, I'm not sure how much of that is driven by um, you know partisan divisions and how much is driven by other stuff, right? But but I would just sort of throw that out there as one way of thinking about the dynamic that's happening. And I you know, and I don't have a. I mean, I, I've put out some solutions of what I think statute would look like, although uh, I'm not sure that. Uh, that my ideas are, have much you know, uh, chance of actually getting enacted politically because of the fact that, uh, that uh, Congress seems to be somewhat stagnant. Well, yeah, I think, th I think those are, are great points. And I, I think uh, some, some kind of a, a super statute that was intended to uh, embody a, a, a long range kind of permanent approach to the problem would be, uh, would be ideal. I think your note about separation of powers is especially perceptive. I mean, I, I think that um, the the really kind of formal and extremely abstract interpretation that the Supreme Court gives to the First Amendment in this area um, has uh, maybe kind of transformed the First Amendment into a sort of separation of powers doctrine along these lines. Yeah, I, I just want to say one thing. It's a super interesting uh, uh, it, you know, in constitutional encroachment problem. But it occurs to me that having Facebook to kick around is actually really great. So mm -hmm. from the perspective of, uh, you know, if you legislate in this area, then all of a sudden you have to take a bunch of positions that everybody won't like, or, or so, uh, you know, insofar as you're unlikely to be able to please all of the people, then you open yourself up. So I wonder whether from the perspective of an individual legislator or you know, whether just kind of run of the mill or high ranking that that actually there's a lot of incentive to sort of free ride on non-regulation 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and keep alive, uh, you know, a kind of bogeyman that everybody can can point to when they want to, right? For whatever purposes, you know, leftist censorship or, or you know, rightist, you know, organization like organizing of paramilitaries or whatever. Uh, Randall Kelso. is in, to me, the contemporary context, while uh, political populism and judicial populism could be used by either the left or the right, it, in today's context, it's just totally used by the right. It's the political populism of the Trump people and the conservative populism of Scalia. And to me, it's all about substance. It's not really that they're populist because they believe in populism. They use populism to preserve what you might call the white supremacy, or as I like to call it, uh, sort of the swamp, a uh, sort of straight, white, affluent male patriarchy, they're trying to preserve that. And in every case, they're trying to preserve that. Uh, so that the Obergefell cases, you know, it's just a matter of, do you prefer gay rights or not? In the Janus case, do you prefer the CEO management or, or the workers or not? Uh, and so you can talk about, it. well, some of those cases, what's populist and what's not? The reality is they split on substantive lines. One side trying to preserve the sort of swamp of uh, white privilege, uh, straight male white privilege, the other trying to, to, to move to a more diverse progressive society. And to me in 20 years, you know, the demographics of the voting population is the progressives are gonna win. You, you, you had 3 million more votes in 2016 with Hillary, 7 million more votes with Biden. You know, 20 years from now, it'll be 15 million more people voting. They're gonna eventually win despite voting restrictions and the electoral college and all that. And when that happens, my instinct is you're not going to have a progressive populism or a progressive judicial populism. I think the populism just disappear um, because it's all about substance. And once the substance 20 years from now moves a little more in a, a liberal direction, um, my instinct is that populism will disappear because it's really only servicing conservative values today, not that it's a neutral theory. But anyway, that's just my observation on that. I think we have only one question left, so we can get it in. Uh, David Odell? Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, sort of uh, reiterate what Jane was suggesting about that, Kyle, you might want to consider uh, sticking with a state action analysis. And I'm not so sure, as Jane is, that it's not going to go nowhere. I wanted to point out that Vivek Ramaswamy and Jet uh, Rubenfeld did a piece in, and look like you're nodding, Kyle, so you apparently have seen that. Uh, I think it's, uh, they made a case that uh, the, the, well, there are a couple of cases uh, that they focused on uh, the immunization idea as providing some kind of a, a, a way for Congress to encourage certain uh, state actors to act uh, as quasi government actors and also the punishment side of it that's so they cited uh, railway employees versus Hansen and Hammerhead case on the second point and um, and so I, I, I do think there is some uh, substantial merit to seeing these uh, apex entities as being uh, part of the governmental situation in this particular setting the other thing I wanted to mention Kyle was that uh, uh, you said on page 12 of your paper that the major platform have struggled famously to tamp down attempts to interfere with elections. And I'm not so sure that's uh, so clear uh, that it, after you look at the, for instance, uh, Molly Ball's piece in time, you, you kind of get the sense that, and you look at uh, Zuckerberg working to, uh, with his money, uh, and I, I understand there may be a distinction between Zuckerberg and Facebook, but uh, there certainly does seem to be uh, an attempt to coordinate uh, action at, uh, for partisan uh, purposes in the electoral process. And I think uh, that kind of statement in your piece needs some qualification uh, on a, re a rewrite. But generally speaking, I, I do think that looking at the apex entities is a very solid thing to think to be thinking about. And I look forward to hearing how you proceed going forward. Thanks. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, you know, as for the the struggle with elections, some of that could just be some some stale language from 2019. I, you know, they were more effective, I think, in in 2020. 
Um, as for the state action um, concept, I'm I'm really sympathetic uh, conceptually. I think a lot of my reason for uh, skepticism about state action is that you still have this problem of how to implement uh, the the underlying value and and administer it. And so I think one way or one way or another, uh, um, you know, giving giving force to these constitutional values is going to have to involve um, some kind of a, a legislative or, or maybe even administrative intervention in addition to the courts. So it's not so much that I'm I'm uh, opposed to the state action idea. I, you know, I, I think the Marsh versus Alabama, that kind of stuff, I, I like all that. But I think we might wind up in the same place anyway, where we, we wind up having to think about uh, these kind of complex mechanisms of enforcement. Okay, well, we are out of time and join me in thanking the panelists for some really engaging and provocative and interesting papers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. And thanks, everyone for your questions and comments. Yeah, thanks, Jane. And th thanks, everybody. Thanks yes, so much. thank you this so much. Great. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye.